Hey, my name is David Cuden. I'm the music curator for the Louisiana State Museum and the curator for New Orleans Jazz Museum. Welcome to Drumsville. This is our exhibit on the history of drums in New Orleans and how it has affected and how it has influenced the rest of the culture of the United States of America. I'm going to take you on a kind of behind the scenes tour and talk about a couple of the artifacts here, and then we're going to bring you master drummer Luther Gray, who's going to talk to you about Congo Square, which is a spot that is the basis of really all African American music in the United States of America. He's also going to talk about this drum that he had made from cypress logs and do a little bit of drumming himself. It's going to be a great time. The Drumsville exhibit takes us basically through the history of drumming in New Orleans, kind of chronologically but it deals with traditional New Orleans jazz, it deals with funk and rock and roll and modern jazz, and also it deals with kind of the hand percussion of the Mardi Gras Indians and washboards and things like that. Um, the first thing I would like to show you is this photo of the John Rogue Show Orchestra. This is the only known photo of a gentleman by the name of Dee Dee Chandler, that gentleman right there. He is the first person who started using a bass drum pedal. In New Orleans, it started out that the brass bands would carry their drums, like you see brass bands do today, but eventually, when they started moving on stage, there was no reason to carry the drums, and the guys got tired, so they said, why don't we just put the drum set down on the ground? In order to do that, and they were the first person to do it, they needed a, a bass drum pedal. And right here is the first extant photo we have of a bass drum pedal. The John Rogue Show Orchestra, 1896, with D.D. Chandler right there. Right here, we have artifacts from two of the greatest funk drummers in history. The first is the great Joseph Zigaboo Modeliste, who played with the meters, among others. Uh, he is one of the guys who really kind of invented modern funk drumming. Uh, and here is kind of the first single on Josie Records, a 45, and the meters doing their famous sissy strum. The one that starts off with, whoa, yeah, doodle doo 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 that. So, and over here, we have a photo of the great Idris Muhammad. Idris Muhammad was the guy who kind of invented soul funk drumming in modern jazz in the late 60s and early 70s. He was a first call drummer in New York for Prestige Records and many others, and he's on all sorts of Blue Note Prestige Records by Lou Donaldson, by Melvin Sparks, and all sorts of things like this. Um, this is his bass drum head, obviously, Idris is on it, that he gave us uh, in the early 2000s. This photo right here is a photo of Alcide Slow Drive Pavajo, the bassist, Joe Watkins, the drummer. They're on a train on their way to a gig in Liverpool, England in the 1950s. At this gig, they will play in Liverpool with the George Lewis band, a young drummer by the name of Richard Starkey will see that, and he will be so inspired by the George Lewis band that not only will he change the way he drums and have a very minimal drum set, but also he will be inspired in a few years to start a band you may have heard of, a band called The Beatles. They are on the way to that gig. That's a photograph of them on the way to that gig. Okay, here we have a couple of actual drums. This is Earl Palmer's floor tone. 1962. Earl Palmer was one of the most recorded drummers in history. He grew up in New Orleans in Treme, started as a tap dancer when he was a kid, and then when he was a kind of a late teen, early 20s, he started playing with the Dave Bartholomew Orchestra, which morphed into the JM studio band that backed up everyone from Fat to Domino to Huey Piano Smith, all those little Richard specialty sides. And then he moved to Los Angeles and became the first call drummer in the Wrecking Crew and drummed on everything from the Beach Boys records to Phil Spector and Wall of Sound records, Jan and Dean, uh, a lot of the Warner Brothers cartoons, uh, Frank Sinatra, he's on some of those records, and this is his tom drum. And over here we have a snare drum with a special logo from the great Stan Moore, who was the drummer for Galactic, uh, who owns Tipitina's now and is a great patron of the museum. Uh, he was nice enough to loan this to us for this exhibit. And then behind me, the great drummer, Boyana Trianova, uh, who works in town with assorted bands. Uh, this is a fantastic photograph of her done by Zach Smith. Hello, I'm Luther Gray, and I'm so glad to be here at the U.S. Mint at the Jazz Museum 
in New Orleans, Louisiana to this afternoon. And uh, I'm a part of the Congo Square Preservation Society organization that's been in, 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 in business for like 30 years, since 1989. I'm also the, the founder of Babula 2000, an amazing music and dance experience that's come out of Congo Square since 1995. And so uh, today I'm here to talk a little bit about this beautiful exhibit, Drumsville, and also the roots of it in terms of Congo Square. Now, we all have heard about Congo Square in New Orleans and how it's the epicenter of, of, of New Orleans culture. And it was also the, uh, the epicenter of indigenous First Nations people before the arrival of the French and the Europeans. And Congo Square was, one of the, it was in the vicinity where there would always be an annual corn harvest ritual in the fall of each year done by the homeless Indians. So even with the homeless Indians, even before the arrival of even Africans who were brought during the transatlantic and the domestic slave trade, it was already sacred ground. So it, it remained sacred ground when Africans started to be brought into this area in 1719 and looking for a place on Sundays where they could perhaps set up a marketplace or have get to see their family and friends maybe dance and play some drums. And these things were happening in the French Quarter area. They, they became kind of migrated to this open area that's now known as Congo Square. And so the drumming, the rhythm of New Orleans really comes out of this sacred ground. And this rhythm that New Orleans has and has spread around the Americas, North, South America, and the Caribbean as well. And it's all rooted in traditional societies of First Nations people and African people. And of course, French and Spanish influences as well. <laughs> Drawing behind me by Latrobe uh, in the mid 18, 1800s uh, really kind of paints a picture of what the gatherings in Congo Squares might have been like. And one of the most uh, talked about aspects of drumming and dancing in Congo Square was the dance called the Bambula that was done, um, it was a dance of love between a man and woman in Congo Square. It, it kind of signified that they were a couple. And it was, it was in the Congolese style, so the bodies were moving, the, sh the hips were moving, the shoulders were moving, they were touching each other in ways that were signified to the community that they were man and wife or a couple. And so this, this word Bambula is so important to New Orleans because it's, it's a it's a word that comes out of the Congo and it means to be reminded of your ancestry. Like Bula, might, might mean, I think, means something like many years ago. And Bob means to be reminded, so to be reminded of our ancestry. And so this rhythm that came out of New Orleans called the Bambula is the basis of what we now know in New Orleans as the second line rhythm, and it is the rhythm of New Orleans. This was a, a labor of love, the, the making of three drums like these in uh, the year 2004. Greg Lambusi, uh, of course, from the New Orleans Jazz Museum, contacted me about it, wanting to commission myself and a, a team of drum makers to create drums that would have been played in Congo Square. So I asked him to find us some cypress wood. And he came back and said he had found a tree down in Morgan. He went to a a company in Morgan City that, that really was working with, with, with wood and the trees and harvesting wood and, and cypress particularly. And he said they had a 200 year old cypress tree that had been uh, buried, in, uh, that had been, that fell into, it's called a sinker cypress. It was like in the Morgan City swamp for over 80 years. And so he brought, he brought this, this uh, 12 foot tree to my house and we cut it into three equal parts. And we uh, began to make these drums that, that, that were brought into the museum in 2006, one year after Hurricane Katrina. So one drum was made for the people of the Congo. And it had a Congolese uh, symbols carved into the wood. One was made for the people of Benin. And that one had a serpent in the wood. Of course, Benin is, uh, is, has all the influences that, that we find in the ones that come from Haiti, New Orleans, they were all rooted in Benin. Of course, the religion of Vodou started in Benin. And then this one is from Senegambia. 
And this was from this was a carved with an antelope in it, and it kind of symbolizes the, the Bambara people. That so many Bambara people of Bambara descent came into New Orleans as well. So with that in mind, we also have to realize that African drumming was language. People look back at our indigenous societies oftentimes, especially Europeans, when they look at when they look at Africa, they say, well, they, didn't, they weren't writing things down. It's because they had oral historians. They had the drums talk their languages because the languages are tonal languages. So if I was to say, Bambula, Bambula, Odabo. So uh, it was a very sophisticated way of communicating messages from village to village over short periods of time. And this is in the time when Europe people or other parts of the world, they were using smoke signals and fire. So I'd like to play a little bit of the rhythm of New Orleans, the Bambula. Oh! 